Hello. Welcome to the last but one, I think, talk of Agile India 2018. Have you had a good conference? Yeah, thank you to the organizers. It's been brilliant. Um, so thank you for coming to this one, choosing my talk. I'm going to be talking today about evolutionary architecture. I'm going to be talking about uh, how I think these days we can take a different approach to designing and building software systems. Actually, quite complicated software systems as well, based on uncovering architecture as we go. So uh, how many in the room were at Gregor's uh, keynote yesterday? So some, excellent. So in that keynote, Gregor mentioned something called real options, option theory, about um, decisions and why decisions uh, and keeping our options open might have value or have value, intrinsic value, and how in an increasingly volatile world where change happens, well, where we require um, change to happen more regularly, actually options and having options and keeping options open it actually has more value. Um, so that's kind of what this talk is about. Uh, that's the betting part of this talk, betting on evolutionary architecture. How can we place small bets, keeping our options open, placing small bets, uh, in order to drive the design of our system. The, the subtitle, A Note on Software Architecture as Code, is about, well, Martin Fowler always sort of describes software architecture as the stuff that's hard to change about, about a piece of software, about an application or a state of applications. And I think that there's a number of techniques that, and practices that we've sort of developed over the last probably even only three years that enable us to make changes to those things that were formerly hard to change very simple ways. So this talk is about keeping our options open, placing small bets, and how we can make small changes based on essentially the scientific methods. So can we run experiments on our code bases to help us make better decisions? I should... That's bad. Oh, it's back. Yeah, you're back in the room. I should probably explain who I am first. So um, this talk is only tangentially about microservices. I wrote this thing with Martin. I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. So I maybe have a hand up for those of you in the room who know ThoughtWorks. So I probably don't need to explain to most people, but we're a bespoke software development company. We started about 25 years ago. We're about 5,000 or so people now globally. We've got a very big uh, center in Bangalore, uh, although annoyingly it's my first time, first time to Bangalore. Um, I've been to Chennai, our Chennai offices before, but I think there's probably about 800 people or so in, in Bangalore now, if not more. Um, so that's what we do. We write software for people. We solve hard problems, and we advise uh, our clients on um, best approaches to, I guess, take advantage of the market volatility that we see. I wrote this thing. It's quite interesting. Um, you can blame Fred for the name and blame me for writing it all down. So I'd like to start with a question, a rhetorical question, I guess. How do we usually make decisions about architecture, design, performance, some of the critical sort of characteristics of our systems? And I would argue, in general, we make them in a, in a couple of different ways. We make them based on experience. All right, well, this, this is good. You know, as you get more experience and you take on more, um, I guess, more experienced roles, um, and you have more responsibility for the design of software, um, it, hopefully, the experience you've had over time building software helps you make better decisions. This is good, actually, right? So there's a thing called the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. As you do a thing more regularly, you develop that skill uh, until you become an expert in it. If you've read the Pragmatic Programmer's uh, book on, um, re I think it's called Refactoring Your Wetware, something like that, that's the subtitle. They talk about the 10,000 hours you need to become an expert. If you've got 10,000 hours in software architecture building software, then, you know, making decisions based on experience is good. But it also comes with a downside, because we have something, there is something, called survivorship bias. This is one of a, a number of cognitive biases that we can't help but fall uh, prey to. And survivorship bias says we're more likely, essentially, to make a decision based on our previous successful experiences. So even though experience is good, it can also steer the way our decisions go in the future. You know, we had a successful project I'll do the next one exactly the same way, that kind of thing. We also do it based on gut feel, I think. Oh, this feels like the right solution, especially as we're in this sort of Dreyfus 
level of expertise. You know, we've got this insight that this feels like the right sort of thing. And Dreyfus, you know, Dreyfus, the Dreyfus model suggests that as you become an expert in something, this is actually a good thing to trust your instincts more. But C.1, survivorship bias, it can lie to you, right? Your gut feel can lie. And oftentimes we decide things up front. And this is a legacy often of the sort of scar tissue we've built up as an industry that makes us think changing things later is hard. And actually changing things later has been hard, especially decisions about things like software architecture, the stuff that's fundamentally hard to change. But I think, and hopefully I'll go through some example, an example of why that's different, I think, now. So this is the question I'm, I'm hoping to answer over the course of this talk. Can we make design decisions more systematically? And if we could, what would that look like? And the way I'm going to explore this question is by reading a book. Part of a strange idea. So who in the room has come across the idea or the, the, the type of, of, of book called Choose Your Own Adventure? OK, not so many people. So this was something that was very popular when I was growing up, I guess, in the sort of late 70s, early 80s, in, I guess, the UK, the US. And this type of book, it's interesting, right? Because they tend to be set in sort of fantasy worlds populated by dragons, wizards, mystical beings and things. And the aim of the book, generally, is to, uh, is, is to set yourself up as a hero and to take decisions, a bit like role-playing Dungeons and Dragons or something like that, um, to help out a village or to smite a mighty dragon or to find a hoard of gold. And when I was trying to work out how best uh, to talk about evolutionary architecture and the sort of decisions we make, I was searching online and I found, I found one of these books about evolutionary architecture. It's quite a strange, strange thing. And it's called The Endlessly Bifurcating Trousers of Reality. Now I think in our industry we don't tell stories often enough. I actually think stories are a really powerful way of communicating the decisions that we've made and the, our experiences that we've had. In fact, a former colleague who's I think now still at Facebook via Google and then ThoughtWorks before that, he talks about the idea of having a team shaman who can gather the team around and tell you the story of how things on your project got that way. I like that idea. And this is a book about a particular project. It tells the story of that project and of some decisions that we made. So let's see what happens when we dive in. The lawful good product owners of a publishing house had long lived in awe and fear of their publishing systems. In awe, they had made a tremendous amount of gold, and in fear of, of the time taken to change them, their, their slowness and their fragility, a messenger was sent to fetch help from a distant land of mighty wizards. You have taken up this challenge. Maybe I should give you some context about what this story is about. So a couple of years ago now, I was involved in rebuilding, re-platforming, re-architecting a very successful 15-year-old um, publishing system for a scientific publishing house. Very successful, it was making upwards of you know, one and a half, depending on the year, one and a half to two billion dollars a year in revenue, so you know, pretty good. Um, but it was a 15-year-old you know, uh, C++ uh, service-oriented architecture that was becoming increasingly difficult to change. And so we were asked in Thoughtworks to come in and see if we could help out by rebuilding this system. This is what the story's about. You must save the product owners by rebuilding their website. You start off the project. In the course of discussions, you discover that your goals are threefold. You need to improve availability, improve performance, and reduce the cost of delay. An enterprise architect approaches and addresses you. You may use summon walk-in skeleton, or you may cast analysis paralysis. Or you may, if you have none of these things, you'll have to draw your sword and fight. I should unpack this, right? So in publishing, it's kind of interesting, especially scientific publishing. Um, availability is directly tied to how much your company is worth. And that's because you have to prove, essentially, how many people have clicked on a link and downloaded a scientific paper. And then you attribute that click to a, an organization that's, uh, that's purchased access to your site and you charge them. And actually, the CEOs of these companies will report quarterly to the stock markets basically how many people have clicked on links. It's kind of interesting. So anytime your site is down globally, someone isn't going to be able to click on the link, and that directly leads to a loss of revenue and actually to your share price. 
uh, increasing or not increasing at the, at the right rate. Need to improve performance. Um, turns out China is a thing, India is a thing, you know, um, Australia is a thing, and this particular website was hosted out of uh, a data center in the, the Midwest of the United States, and so performance in places like China, places like India, places like Australia, especially in Australia where they have to still bust the internet in on ships with USB sticks. That's true, I don't know if you know that. Um, but in pr uh, performance was, was a pain, up to 15 seconds for page load. And they wanted to reduce the cost of delay, improve the cost of delay. So they wanted to make, be able to make changes to their system more rapidly. They wanted to be able to deliver more value more quickly, be able to deliver more value to their customers more quickly. So what should we do? We could summon a walk-in skeleton. We could cast analysis paralysis. So a walk-in skeleton, if you haven't come across this before, is the thinnest slice through your system that you could make to prove out your path to production and to prove out the first user story or requirement that you're writing. What should we do? Walk-in skeleton, hands up. Analysis paralysis, really don't care. Yeah, that's most of you, okay, excellent, right? Um, well, in this case, what we did is cast analysis paralysis. You cast analysis paralysis at the enterprise architect. Foolish young adventurer, says the architect. We follow the evolutionary school of architecture, and we, sh we shall have none of the lawful evil ways of waterfall. The last thing you see before everything goes dark is the architect in counting in a strange voice. You have died, turn to page one. Oh dear. So perhaps we'll summon a walk-in skeleton instead. So the walk-in skeleton is a fairly well understood sort of practice. Um, I can't remember the exact derivation, but I know Nat Price and Steve Freeman talk about it in their seminal book on um, test-driven design, growing object-oriented systems guided by tests. So we'll summon a walk-in skeleton and see what happens. Your walk-in skeleton coalesces in a cloud of noxious gases and solidifies as a Java drop wizard application. You reach into your backpack and deploy a content store. Your walk-in skeleton reaches out its skeletal arms and grabs armfuls of raw XML. Would you like to transform the XML inside the microservice, the skeleton, or use a magic box, another microservice? So generally in publishing, what happens is you have a publishing pipeline where you have a set of documents that are edited, submitted by researchers, edited, edited, lots of reviews go on, and then it's turned into a big pile of XML and pushed through to some store where you need it to be transformed and displayed to your users. In our case, all this content was pushed into S3. We had a giant, enormous uh, number of uh, XML documents sitting in, sitting in X3, and we had to transform these somehow into HTML uh, so we could show our users. And, you know, we could take different decisions at this point. We can either, inside our, our single application that we've already created, we can write some functions in there, maybe create a module that will do the transformation, display the HTML to our user, or we can, uh, we can separate that concern into a separate service. We can push that into another microservice. And that's interesting because this is the first point at which we've got options about where to go. This is the first point we can start to think about the bets that we can place, the different decisions that we can make. This is a divergent evolutionary graph showing how species diverge over time. And actually, this is kind of an imaginary look at the future states for this system based on the decisions that we can make. You know, at one point, we might be able to, we might decide to transform the content within a module in the walking skeleton. But we also you know, on the other hand, might say, we'll create this extra micro microservice. And at this point, we're diverging. The architecture that we're building, this design of our system is diverging. And, you know, reductio ad absurdum, if you go down one path, you end up with a distributed system composed of a number of microservices. But if you go down the other path, you end up with a sort of monolithic MVC type app. Everything is, you know, is contained within that single application. And this is what I mean about options, about placing small bets. How do you decide which path to follow? So I call this betting on evolutionary architecture. So what's the, the definition of bet? It's the act of gambling money on the outcome of a race game or other unpredictable event. There's a good deal of betting at the races going on. I guess that's quite apt, being I think we're at number one race course road at the moment, right? Isn't that true? I think it is. So the act of placing a, 
placing a bet on some un, some outcome that we don't know about yet, it's an unpredictable event. And a lot of people think that building software is predictable. You know, certainly most of the project managers I've ever worked with think that predicting software, that building software is a predictable thing. But actually, what we're talking about when we're building software, we're talking about a complex adaptive system. By definition, by definition, it's unpredictable what's going to happen in a complex adaptive system. We've got a number of people involved in building this. We've got a number of decisions that we can make. It's a complex adaptive system. It's unpredictable by its nature, and becoming more so as business requirements change at an ever-increasing rate. Betting on evolutionary architecture. So I would argue that the idea of an evolutionary approach to architecture allows us to place small bets and then reevaluate our decisions based on the outcomes of those bets. This is the options that Gregor was talking about. We can create options for what we do in the future. We can have a, a number of different options. Each of these is going to have associated a cost and a value. I have to spend some money to do this thing, but it's if it, but if this thing if, if the bet um, if the bet uh, is a successful bet and we've correctly predicted the outcome, then we're going to get we're going to get some value back. In comparison, the idea of, sort of this upfront design phase that we do on a lot of projects, this is sort of the equivalent of betting the house, right? We're going to guess at the start of a project exactly what the finished end state should be. We're going to place all our money on a single bet. Bet the house. I don't like betting my house. I quite like my house. <laughs> Maybe I'm not just a betting, I'm just not, not a betting man. So back to the story. What we decided to do was create another microservice. That was the option that we purchased and uh, implemented. You throw the magic box in between the walk-in skeleton and the content store. A villager approaches and exclaims, this beautiful content I see before me takes an awful long time to get here. You must somehow make the content arrive faster. If you have an HTTP cache in your inventory, you may use it now. And we've gone, again, got a number of options. We've got a distributed system. We've created options, actually, by creating a distributed system. We can cache in between S3, where our XML is, and the content microservice, or we could cache between uh, the sort of proxy fronting stuff and our microservice, the content, that, the content microservice that's doing the transformation. So this is what, you know, in a noddy way, this sort of architecture looks like. We had some sort of uh, templating, um, basically, edge side includes templating uh, application at the top, a little microservice that was just doing. Um, returning uh, HTML to our users. Uh, then we have this computationally expensive service which was using one of the greatest functional languages of all time, XSLT. And that was transforming the XML into some HTML. And then we had some XML in X3 and we had a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of other services. And when I said about you know, availability, performance and things, these, these were the performance requirements that we had for our users globally. It was a 0.8 seconds time to first byte and one and a half seconds page loads, no matter where you were in the world. So pretty, you know, pretty stringent constraints. And when we first started testing whether we were, we were meeting these cross-functional requirements, we got this sort of answer out. So our page load time was about 35 seconds. Now, I mean, I, I'm a physicist, not a mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that 35 is greater than one and a half. Right? I think we can, we can all agree that that is a thing. Which is bad, right? This is, this is kind of a bad thing. Hence us thinking about caching. Hence us thinking about where are we going to put this cache? Are we going to put it in front of the computationally expensive service or behind it? Let's put some caching in. So again, we've reached one of these decision points, right? Where we've got a number of options that, that, that have been created and that we can buy. We've detected performance problems. Let's just add a cache. Now, the thing about caching Who's implemented a cache in the room? <laughs> right, OK, a few people. How many of you think that's an easy thing to do of those people who implemented a cache? There's lots of no, and there's not a single hand going up for those people at the front. But that's because caching is hard, and caching is hard for very good reasons. Right? We can either put this cache in front, or we can put it behind. Now, the thing is with, with, with things like scientific publishing, it's not like news publishing. With a newspaper, right, you know the sort of stuff you need to catch. 
the sort of stuff you need to cache is the stuff that's accessed all the time, right? It's the stuff that's published, that's just been published, and maybe over the last day has been published. But with scientific papers, you might be accessing something that's 100 years old. It might be something uh, that was published in a journal 200 years ago that has been OCR'd into uh, XML uh, and put in your content store. So essentially, rather than having a nice set of, cache uh, of cacheable uh, documents where cache hits predominate, with scientific publishing, you've got the opposite, right? Cash hit, cash misses are always going to predominate unless you pre-populate the cash. So this is actually a tricky set of options to evaluate. Every talk with a cash in it has to have this, uh, this, this quote from Phil Carlton. There are only two hard things in computer science, cash invalidation and naming things. I've got a bonus joke for you if anyone's done any messaging. There are only two hard things in messaging. Exactly once delivery, one delivery order, exactly once delivery, ha ha. So, you know, this idea of let's just add a cache, no one ever said let's just add a cache, right? This is a decision that we don't take lightly when we're building out software. So how do we decide what to do? How do we decide which option, which option to purchase, which bet to place? So I called the subtitle a note on software architecture as code. How do we decide which bets to place? Does anyone recognize this guy? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Shout it. Go on. Yeah. Feynman. Richard Feynman. Absolutely. Nobel Prize winning physicist, bongo player, safe cracker. Richard Feynman's got what I think is, is my favorite definition of the scientific method. So bear with me. We'll just take a look at his definition. In general, we, no we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. And when he does this, you can actually go to the lecture online where he actually he describes this. It's called On the Characteristics of Natural Law, I think. Um, when he says, we guess it, the whole audience collapses in laughter. This is the great Nobel Prize winning physicist, Richard Feynman, saying, the scientific process starts with a guess. But actually, he goes on to say, then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what would be implied if this law that we guessed is right, then we compare the result of the computation to nature, with experiment, compare it directly with observation to see if it works. And this is the crucial bit. If it disagrees with experiment, it is wrong. In that simple statement, he says, is the key to science. He also goes on to say, and I think this is lovely, it does not make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It does not make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's simply wrong. And that goes for what I'm saying up here as well. Don't just believe what I'm saying because I'm standing on stage. If what I say disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. So that's interesting. Let's unpack this. So what he says is, first of all, we observe nature. Then we make a guess. We compute the implications of our guess. And we compare the results of those implications with nature. And then we draw our conclusion. So what would that look like if we were trying to use this approach these days with the practices that I'll describe momentarily to make decisions about which bets to place in our software architectures? Well, we need to observe some metrics. We need to make our guess. So we need to observe the current state of our universe. We need to make a guess, make a small change, run the experiment, measure results, compare that with the results of our experiment, and then ask ourselves, was I right? Is this the, the correct experiment? Did we place our bet correctly? So what do we need to do this? Observable systems. We need a brain. Most of us have got that, I hope. The ability to deploy small changes quickly. We need some form of lightweight probes so we can run small experiments. So the next section is on these practices. There are more as well. So the first is good monitoring, observable systems. Observability has become a thing recently, um, which, is, which is good. And I think it's become a thing because of the prevalence these days of people building distributed systems. But we talk about monitoring. Monitoring. What does monitoring actually mean? I want to credit Dan North with this definition of monitoring. So Dan talks about monitoring as being composed of five elements. The first is instrumentation. So this is the fact that our code and hardware describes what it's doing. Uh, we have the ability inside our code 
for it to describe its execution and the amount of time it's taken to do things. We then need telemetry. Right? We have to get a, have a way of getting that data from our system to somewhere else. We have a way of gathering that data. Then we need some visualization. We need to understand what's happening in our systems and using by meaningfully visualizing that data. And then alerting, right? We need to take some action based on what we find. And there's a bonus one, which is predictive alerting. Uh, but that's kind of uh, outside the scope of this talk. So we need some monitoring. What do I mean by all this stuff? Well, I've said for a long time, if you've got uh, a distributed system, the sort of minimum you should be looking for in terms of observability of that system should include end-to-end -end request latency. It should include system health, service health. It should include monitoring of downstream dependencies of those systems. It should include OS metrics. And it should include things like request tracing. So this should, should be the sort of minimum set of uh, uh, metrics that we should be build, building into systems to make them observable and so that we can make decisions about stuff. In our case, in the scientific publishing world, this was a couple of years ago now, uh, and we had a whole set of tools that we were using to make our, to make our system to turn it into an observable system. So we were using things like hysterix for circuit breakers, we were using tenacity, uh, coda hell metrics, because we were using drop wizards, we were using things like breaker bots and yammer. We had a whole bunch of stuff that we visualized. This is our graphite uh, visualization of, I think this is request latency. Actually, yeah. And then this is a dashboard that we put together using Hysterix dashboard of all of our circuit breakers in the system. So we can see exactly uh, what's happening with when services are making calls to external services. Then we need sort of continuous delivery, I think which I'm going to define for the purposes of this talk is the ability to safely and sustainably reduce lead time to value. These are the three monkeys of uh, continuous delivery, Dan North, Sam Newman, and Jez Humble. And because he's not in the photo, we've got Dave Farley popping in at the corner. So these were the original authors of, or some of the original authors of Continuous Delivery, the book, uh, but only Jez and Dave managed it through the umpteen years it took them to write it. So um, yeah, the four monkeys of continuous delivery I mentioned to Chris Reed is not there. So what do we mean by continuous delivery? Okay, yeah, we're on the continuous delivery and DevOps track. I'm not going to harp on about what continuous delivery looks like. But very simply, we need some way to safely um, and automatically uh, push code from developer, hey, it works in my machine, into some repository somewhere, create an artifact, and then progress that through a build pipeline, applying progressively uh, more tests to that, uh, to that, to that artifact before finally we deploy into production. And as we go one way, we get more prod-like. The other way, clearly, we get faster feedback. So we've actually called this out on the ThoughtWorks technology radar a couple of years ago, well, maybe it was last year, where we had pipelines for infrastructure as code in trial. And that's a key to the technique of software architecture as code, I think, is actually having the ability to push not just changes to our the functionality, the features in our software through one of these pipelines into production, but with a special mention to Keith, issues in the room, the ability to push changes to our infrastructure code through automatically, through like tested, uh, through pipelines where tests are applied or tests are run, and we can deploy this stuff automatically into production. Because of course, you know, these days, if you're deploying software without using something like Ansible, without using something like Terraform, well, you know, you may as well go home, right? Okay, so not everyone is cloud native yet. This is the way we're going. So the idea of pipelines automatically testing our infrastructure as code, our infrastructure code, as we push that through into production, is gaining is gaining traction. And what that allows us to do is actually go through this cycle in a really short period of time. So previously, in order to make a change to our deployment of topography, shall we say, maybe, we might have to wait months for servers to be provisioned. We might have to wait, wait months for firewalls to be reconfigured. The lead time to things that were hard to change was long. Whereas these days, when we use techniques like continuous delivery of infrastructure code, we can make sweeping changes to our infrastructure in a really short period of time, safely and sustainably. So the lead time to doing that has massively decreased. The other thing we need is some form of probe, right? We need to be able to understand. We, we can observe our system. We know what the world looks like. But we need to be able to, we need to, be able to run some form of testing to understand right, what the results of our experiments are, the changes that we're making. 
And when I talk about performance testing, I talk about specifically lightweight performance testing. I'm not talking about the sort of thing you do right at the end of the project, right, where you get Gatling up and Locust and you know, insert load runner and insert your very heavy tool here fairly heavy tool here. I'm talking about really simple lightweight tests, stuff you can put into your build pipelines that run for a minute or so that just give you some form of baseline, some idea of how your system is performing. And I think when you combine that, the ability to make rapid change to your infrastructure code as well as your, your feature code, if you like, your functional code, and the ability to observe our systems, you get some interesting things. What I'm not talking about terms of performance testing. If you search on Wikipedia, this is the sort of word cloud for performance testing that comes up, right? Now, there's tons of types of performance tests. I'm talking about very, very simple ones. And on the technology radar, we had this idea on it as well a couple of years ago, simple performance tracking. So what sort of thing do I mean? There are tools out there we can just stick into our build pipelines with very little effort. Apache Bench, that's literally how you run Apache Bench. It's not hard. We can use Siege. Siege is another nice tool for doing this sort of stuff. Or there's another, another nice tool written in Golang called Vegeta. I actually quite like Vegeta because it allows you, it gives you the ability. Um, the others tend to just fire off a ton of requests at an endpoint and then tell you at the end of it um, the, the latency and the metrics for, them, for the, the results of the test. With Vegeta, you can specify a rate at which requests should be issued. So you can say, I want to run for a minute with 10 requests per second. And that means you can use those results as a tracer bullet, if you like, to understand the performance characteristics of your system. And then I think we need some form of cloud. Well, this is enabled, certainly, by cloud native infrastructure as code. And shout out to the guy sitting in the second row. Uh, Keith, obviously, just you know, this was last year, I believe, Keith, Keith uh, published this book, Infrastructure as Code. This, this idea that we can, we can describe our infrastructure in a way that we would describe features in our system through code and automatically progress changes to those through into production. Yeah, so tools in this space, things like AWS and small things like Botto, and this is actually the tool chain that we use to create this image of a blue-green deploy in our system, just interrogating uh, the AWS APIs using Botto. Simple stuff. So. Back to our scientific method. We've got the ability to observe nature. We've got good monitoring observable systems, a brain. We've got the ability to quickly deploy small changes, right? Small changes to things that were used to be hard to change, used to have long lead times to change, and lightweight probes. So what happens in this story I was telling when we put all this together, which we did? You may remember I said at the time, this was our requirement, 0.8 seconds time uh, TTFB, and one and a half seconds page load, and we started off at 30 seconds, 35 seconds. Hmm. Said Batman. At this point, we've got a number of options. These are the small bets. These are the options that we can, we can, we can purchase. We've got one option, which is to add CPU. Right? And I'll come to that in a second. We've got another option, which is to cache content in one of two places, cache in front of S3, or cache service in front of the service. So in order to work out which option to purchase, we ran some experiments. So we observed nature. We understood what was going on in our system. This is 35 seconds. Our hypothesis was that XSLT can actually be quite expensive, perhaps we are CPU bound. We ran some performance tests after computing some implications. Maybe if we increase the number of CPUs, that would help. And then we, we would compare the results with nature. And after adding more CPUs, this is what we got. We were down to six seconds. I want to say adding more CPUs, again, right? This is possible now by changing one line of code, right? In your playbooks. We got down to six seconds, which is better. Our second guess maybe we should move compute to the data. So we were running uh, our infrastructure in uh, the Amazon region in, um, in Dublin, EU West 1, but our, our data, the XML, was sitting in the S3 region in the US. So we posited that perhaps going across the Atlantic every single time we wanted to uh, uh, render some data was maybe not helping us. 
So perhaps we could move compute to the data. And we did that. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a few more lines of code to change, but we brought down our production infrastructure in Europe, brought it up again in the US, and after we did that, we were down to about four seconds. We saved two seconds on the hops across the Atlantic. It's pretty good. The third guess we made is that transformations are slow and maybe we could optimize those transformations. And the nice thing about this is because we'd instrumented all of the transformation code, we knew exactly how long these transformations took. This is a pretty good guess. Uh, once we optimized the transformations, we were down to about three and a half seconds. Pretty good. And finally, after we bought all those options, ran all those experiments, implemented all these changes in our code, and moved our production infrastructure from Europe to the US, increased the size of the number of CPUs, or increased the instance sizes of the boxes doing the transformations, we were down to about three and a half seconds. And the final option we were left with was to cache. And initially, we put our cache in between templating and the, the, the transformation service, basically. And once we did that, we got down to about 0.2 seconds. Page Woo! You've got to be happy, right? I mean, if you're on that program, or if you're on that project, that's the total result. 0.2 seconds per page load. And some of these things are big documents, right? So we're talking... 50, 100, sometimes 200 megabytes. Obviously, we were paging some stuff. But still, this is pretty good, 1.2 seconds. So going back to our sort of graph of these options, these bets that we were placing, what did we do? We chose to create another service to transform content. This is one bet. And then after purchasing some other options, adding, you know, increasing the number of CPUs, moving data, moving compute to the data, um, tuning the transform service, etc. We got to this other point. Do we add a cache? Well, we have further options. We can put a cache in front of S S3. That's one bet. We can put a cache in front of the content service. That's another bet. And in both of these cases, we've got different trade-offs to make. In the one hand, we're going to save just the fetch from S3, which is a couple of hundred milliseconds. It actually varies between about 150 in our case up to about 500. There's actually a secondary industry now in monitoring S3 latency. We didn't know that. Which is kind of weird. Or we could cache in front of the content service. And that's going to save that fetch, but it's also going to save our XSLT transform time. And that's what give us, gave us the massive boost down to 0.2 seconds. <coughs> we didn't just save the fetch. We, <coughs> we also saved the milliseconds involved in running the transformation over sometimes very large documents. So, the result of this. Content trickles into the store. You keep up by listening for the new content and casting wugget on the cache to keep it refreshed. New types of content appears, content the villagers have never seen before. Content the walking skeleton is unable to combat. Every time the structure of the content changes, the cache must be refreshed. The cache grows and grows until blah, blah, blah. It is no longer possible to refresh it. Latency increases. You have died. Turn to page one. So what happened? Why did we sort of hit this problem? Let me unpack that. Basically what happened was um, we made this guess that we wanted to save the transform time as well. The problem, of course, is as we're actively developing this, right, we're making changes to the API, the content API. Every time we want to make a change to the content API, we need to invalidate the whole cache of tens of thousands of objects and rebuild it. And eventually it got to the point where that just wasn't doable. We can either cache in front of the content or in front of S3. And actually, one of these was an evolutionary dead end in our case. But remember what I'm saying. The changes we're making to, the, to, to our infrastructure are incredibly small. This is all version controlled. Standing up Varnish is, a, is applying a set of templates, essentially, to your infrastructure. That's a catch. So what, what did we do? We rolled back. And then we made a different set of small changes and applied those changes to put the cache in front of S3. So whilst we didn't save the content transformation time, we did save uh, the time on fetch. The cache causes the content load to drop from 300 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds. Everything was brilliant. wasn't quite as good as 
we originally thought, but it was still well within the limits of our requirements. The villagers are happy. I think it's time to close this book, finish the story. So I guess I'm going to kind of sum up by talking about you know, this idea of real options and small bets. And what I mean when I say we've got, we can apply different approaches now to building software, to designing our software systems. Right? Making small changes and pushing those through into production is no longer limited just to our functional code, just to the code uh, that is delivering features to our users. We can now apply the same techniques to things that were really hard to do if we have a set of uh, practices in place, continuous delivery and so on. We can place much smaller bets. We can create more options more cheaply. We no longer have to bet the house. So in summary, I guess what I'm saying is to apply this technique, we need some way of observing nature, which we do. We have some way of running experiments. So performance testing, I'm saying, doesn't have to be heavyweight. We can use simple tools to gain deep insight into our systems. And then we have the ability now to rapidly change all the things not just some of the things. So cloud native infrastructure, continuous delivery for infrastructure. In summary, evolutionary architecture, this sort of approach, purchasing options, placing smaller bets, keeps our options open longer. These techniques, CD, lean product engineering, infrastructure as code, they reduce the amount of money we need to place on a bet. We don't have to bet the house anymore. We can make small changes which cost much less. And using this sort of lightweight probes, we can make guesses and test our hypotheses, hypotheses much more simply. And I think with a few minutes for questions, that's going to be me. Thank you very much.